Ezekiel 8 for Bible study. In the sixth year, in the sixth month, on the fifth day, while I was sitting in my house, and the elders of Judah were sitting before me, the hand of the sovereign Lord came on me there. I looked, and I saw a figure like that of a man. From what appeared to be his waist down, he was like fire, and from there up, his appearance was as bright as glowing metal. He stretched out what looked like a hand and took me by the hair of my head. The Spirit lifted me up between earth and heaven, and in visions of God, he took me to Jerusalem, to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court, where the idol that provokes to jealousy stood. And there before me was the glory of the God of Israel, as in the vision I had seen in the plain. God is telling you up front what you're about to see. You are about to learn who the, the idol of, that provokes to jealousy is. What is that idol? Another way of speaking about the idol that provokes to jealousy is the abomination of desolation. That's what you're about to see. Now, in this entire timeline of Ezekiel, since the first chapter, he's been talking about those creatures that are associated with the witnesses. Then he goes into talking about Ezekiel as a watchman, which is exactly what God's witnesses are. That is why God's witnesses and prophets have been appointed is as a watchman. You are not to be afraid of them. If you are afraid of them, I will make you afraid in front of them, right? That's what he told Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 17. So you are to go and eat the words that I give you. Eat the words that I put in your mouth. Eat the words of the scroll, the lament, warning, the warning that I'm giving these people through you. He warns they're going to be obstinate. They're not going to listen to you. They're going to fight against you. I'm going to parcel them out. Shave your head. Here, this, is Jeru this represents Jerusalem. Throw some to the wind, some in the fire. Tuck a few in the fold of your garment. You hear what God's telling Ezekiel? Exactly what I've been telling you this whole time about my experience and what I hear from the Lord. So it should not, pr it should not surprise you that this timing is following exactly what we read in Revelation. What did we read in Revelation? From the very beginning, Jesus is rebuking uh, the bodies of believers. He tells two lampstands, two churches, two bodies of believers that they're doing well, continue in that until the end. He warns them, you're going to be put in prison, you're going to be killed. And, you know, in the end, I'm going to make those people who claim to be Jews but are of the synagogue of Satan, I'm going to make them bow down and acknowledge that I have loved you. So he's already warning them, you're going to be persecuted by those who claim to be doing a service to God. Same warning he gave the first set of witnesses, which were the apostles. Now, as time progresses, as, as you saw in Revelation, the witnesses are activated. He warns, the witnesses are activated. He starts sending judgment. He starts separating the wheat from the tares in these trumpets. You see a symbolism of that when he tells Ezekiel to shave his hair and throw some to the wind, some to the fire, tuck some in the fold of his garment. There's a lot more being thrown to the wind and the fire, aren't there? Separating the wheat from the tares. Now, as those trumpets are blowing and as the, the witnesses are testifying, people are having an opportunity. Not everyone, by the way. Some people are being cut off. But those who remain in the land have an opportunity to return to him and remain in him. And they better do it with all their heart, mind, and soul. They should not have a wicked idea in their heart that they can just delay this a little bit longer or go take a vacation from doing what they exist to do. Pedal to the metal, guys. Put the hand to the plow and don't look back. You see the way these, these uh, witnesses are. You see that spirit of God or the, the, the creatures that come out from God that they don't look to the left or the right and they're not looking behind, that's for sure. They go where the spirit goes. They are single-minded. They have a singleness of purpose and they are dedicated to that purpose until it's fulfilled. Jesus spoke this way too. He said, I, have, I am under great constraint. Luke 12, 50. I have a baptism to undergo and what constraint I am under until it is completed. Is that the attitude of one who is singly focused? And what did he say when the Pharisees were giving him a hard time for healing people on the Sabbath? He said, my father's working all the time. He didn't stop, did he? That is the same spirit operating in the witnesses. They don't stop. They are working all the time for the kingdom of heaven. Did you see me stop when my daughter was suffering during her pregnancy? Did you see me stop when my grandson was born? Have you seen me stop 
when I'm enduring hardship or have you seen me expose that hardship and take you along so that you can see what you must do when you are going through these things, how you must think, how you must believe in God that he's sovereign and that he knows what he's doing in every circumstance of your life. What have you seen me do? You watched me stand on scripture. You watched me cry out. You watched me rend my heart and bring myself low and fast and pray and lay myself out for you. You know what I'm told on a daily basis? This is too much work. I don't have the time. Oh, I'm just not devoted to the Lord that way. I got to wait until I am. I'm sorry. What are you waiting for? For him to make that decision or for you? So the timeline is going to follow the same pattern because it's the same timeline that God has established. The Antichrist is going to rise from the abyss. The beast will rise from the abyss, overpower and kill the witnesses when the first, excuse me, when the fifth trumpet blows. That will begin its 42 month reign, 1290 days after the witnesses are killed. The abomination of desolation will be, will set, be set up and that will incite God's jealous wrath. That is when God will rise and his great wrath will begin for 45 days. That's what we're talking about here. And what does it say? God took me to Jerusalem to the entrance of the north gate of the inner court where the idol that provokes to jealousy stood. You're about to know what that idol is. And there before me was the glory of the God of Israel as in the vision I had seen in the plain. Verse five, then he said to me, son of man, look toward the north. So I looked and in the entrance of the nor north of the gate of the altar, I saw the idol of jealousy. He saw it. And that means he's going to tell us what it is. And he said to me, son of man, do you see what they're doing? The utterly detestable things the Israelites are doing here, things that will drive me far from my sanctuary, but you will see things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance of the court. I looked and I saw a hole in the wall. He said to me, son of man, now dig into the wall. So I dug into the wall and saw a doorway there. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked and detestable things they're doing there. So I went in and looked and I saw portrayed all over the walls, all kinds of crawling things and unclean animals and all the idols of Israel. In front of them stood seven elders of Israel and Jasaniah, son of Shaphan, was standing among them. Each had a censer in his hand and a fragrant cloud of incense was rising. What is a cloud of incense? Well, in Revelation, it was the prayers of God's people. Here, these are prayers that are being lifted up, but they're not being lifted up to God. He said to me, son of man, have you seen what the elders of Israel are doing in the darkness, each at the shrine of his own idol? They say the Lord does not see us. The Lord has forsaken the land. Again, he said, you will see them doing things that are even more detestable. Then he brought me to the entrance of the north gate of the house of the Lord. And I saw women sitting there mourning the God Tammuz. Huh, who's the God Tammuz? He said to me, do you see this son of man? You will see things that are even more detestable than this. He then brought me to the inner court of the house of the Lord, and there at the entrance to the temple between the portico and the altar were about 25 men with their backs turned toward the temple of the Lord and their faces turned toward the, toward the east. They were bowing down to the sun in the east. He said to me, have you seen this son of man? Is it a trivial matter for the people of Judah to do the detestable things they're doing here? Must they also fill the land with violence and continually arouse my anger? Look at them putting the branch to their nose. Therefore, I will deal with them in anger. I will not look on them with pity or spare them. Although they shout in my ears, I will not listen to them. That is the last mention of what he's showing them in the temple. So women mourning the God of Tammuz, which is a fertility God and a sun God, which is the reason you see the men, the 25 men who are supposed to be working the temple, who are bowing down to the east, to the sun. Now, let me demonstrate something for you. Counterfeit Christianity worships the sun. They follow in their harlot mother, in the practices of their harlot mother, worshiping various sun gods. The image of the cross. You remember when God said you're not to set up an image in heaven or on earth of anything in heaven or on earth? That image of the cross. The word talks about the significance of the cross but counterfeit Christianity set up an image of the cross through Constantine at the battle at the Milvian Bridge between Emperor Constantine and Maxentius. Constantine, in order to gain political power, after the battle had already been won, 
claimed that he received a vision from Jesus telling him to set up an image on his soldiers of the cross and claimed that Jesus told him by this sign, by the sign, by this image, you mean, you will conquer. That's an image. And all of counterfeit Christianity has it up on their steeples, on their altars. Some of it, some of them even tattoo it to their bodies. Boy, what an honor to God. Never mind that he said, don't tattoo your body. Now you're going to tattoo a cross to your body. Not even recognizing that it is a sign of counterfeit. It is a, an image of counterfeit Christianity. Now let's talk about that sun god or the many sun gods they worship. Changing Saturday Sabbath to Sunday. Telling you that you're celebrating Christ on what they call Christmas based on the Gregorian calendar, not on God's calendar. Okay, how's that work? I see. So Christ was born according to the Gregorian calendar, December 25th. You know what December 25th is? You know what the Gregorian calendar is? First of all, it revolves around the sun. God's calendar is a lunar calendar. The Gregorian calendar that was set up by Constantine that we use today, January, February, March, April, 365 days, that was set up by Constantine, by the Catholic Church. And it is based on the sun because they worship sun gods. Those so-called halos that are around the, the heads in all of their art, around the heads of all the saints and, and so-called Jesus, that is a sun, guys. That is the sun that goes around the head of their false god Mithras, their sun god who was born on December 25th or was claimed to have been born on, on December 25th. That's what you're celebrating. You're not celebrating the birth of Jesus. Don't deceive yourself. There is no Christmas in the Bible, first of all. Second of all, that is not God's calendar. If you knew the word, you'd understand that. You set up that tree. That tree is also a symbol of worship, worshiping the trees of the forest. How about the Yuletide log? Also a symbol of worship. You understand how you've been deceived? Why is this detestable? It is a symbol of counterfeit Christianity. All of counterfeit Christianity worships the sun, not S-O-N, S-U-N. They love to pretend that these things have to do with Jesus. They'll even tell you that those little figurines and statues and things that the Catholic Church sets up, they'll even tell you that's wrong. You're not supposed to do that. And yet they'll set up a nativity scene little statues, hello, of Jesus and the so-called wise men and Mary and Joseph, they'll set those things up alongside their Christmas tree, also a symbol of worship. And they'll set it up inside their churches. They'll put a cross on their steeple. They'll, they'll wear them around their necks, even wearing diamond crosses. Oh yes, that's such, a, such an honor to God for you to adorn what you claim to be an image of God in the world, adorn it in the world. These things are detestable to God. That cross is a cross to Tammuz, their sun god. It is not an image that God told anyone to set up because he told you not to set up an image. Why do you think he told you that so many thousands of years before an image was set up in counterfeit Christianity? Do you think he might have known that that was going to happen? Do you think it might be a sign between you and him as to whether you're actually in him. When you hold to his holy days rather than the world's holidays, do you think it might be a sign as to whether you're in him that you hold fast to the commands he's given you in the Bible not to set up an image? Do you think it might be a sign as to whether you're in him? And as a matter of fact, it tells us in the Bible that if you obey his Sabbath, that will be a sign between you and him. Well, what's his Sabbath? Is his Sabbath on the seventh day or is it on the first day of the week? Because my Bible says it's on the seventh day of the week, which is Friday evening to Saturday evening. The first day of the week is what you're calling Sunday. Many are going to come to him in that day when he comes back and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do these things in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, evildoers. I never knew you. These people who think that they are doing these things in his name, what do you think their fate is? The abomination of desolation is that cross to Tammuz. And it is set up in the temple of God. It is set up where it ought not be inside of each individual and inside of counterfeit Christianity collectively. That is the abomination of desolation. 
The mark of the beast is likewise. There's an image and then there's a mark. And that mark is counterfeit Christianity. It is the covering, the band-aid, the lie. That is the mark of the beast. And so if you continue in these ways, if you continue observing these things, and I don't care what justification you have. I don't care if what you're saying is, well, I'm going to celebrate it to Christ and therefore it's okay. No, you can't do that. You don't celebrate Satanism to Christ. That's ridiculous. At one time when I was discerning this, I had been working with someone and Uh, I made the mistake of turning to her. I made the mistake of turning to her interpretation and what she was saying she received from God. And we had been discerning this and it was, you know, a few years back and, and I had been praying about it, but I didn't follow it through. And I made a big mistake there and I sinned against God. When she came back to me, she said, well, the thing that I keep receiving from God is as long as I celebrate this to Christ... And I didn't question it. I turned to her. You know, the word tells me, if you repent, I will restore you and you will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you. You must not turn to them. I turned to her. I listened to her interpretation and I did not receive that from God. And I celebrated it for one more year. And then he convicted me that I must do away with this. And that year, I mean, he was kind of taking things away from me, right? Like I used to have these Wizard of Oz ornaments on my tree, which now I look at the Wizard of Oz and I'm like, this is so ridiculous, so incredibly satanic. I'm a good witch, not a bad witch. And the, and Oz being like, you know, this representation of God behind the curtain, repulsive. And that's what we we fed to our kids. So I threw those away. And you know what I did? That year I covered my Christmas tree in crosses. Do you know how detestable and shameful and disgusting that is to me today? But I'm glad that he had me do that. I'm so glad that I went through that process because my best ideas of righteousness are so filthy, absolutely filthy. And the very next year, he had me throwing everything out. Let this people turn to you. You must not turn to them. And he taught me how to listen to him single-mindedly so that I will know that I have heard from him. I made that mistake by turning to that woman, by turning to, you know, previously turning to sermons and, you know, things like that, listening to what other people rationalize and justify in their lives. We can't be doing that. The abomination of desolation is the cross to Tammuz. It demonstrates it very plainly in Ezekiel. The women are mourning Tammuz, a fertility god, The men are bowing down to the sun in the east because Tammuz is also a sun god. And this is the symbol of counterfeit Christianity, the covering, the lie.